Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean makes it super simple to launch a Kubernetes cluster in minutes. The DigitalOcean Kubernetes platform empowers developers to launch their containerized applications into a managed production-ready cluster without having to maintain or configure the underlying infrastructure. They seamlessly integrate everything with the rest of the DigitalOcean stack, including load balancers, firewalls, object storage spaces, and block storage volumes. They even have built-in support for public and private image registries like Docker Hub and Quay.io. Developers can now run and scale container-based workloads with ease with the DigitalOcean platform. Learn more and get started for free with a $50 credit at do.co slash changelog. Again, do.co slash changelog. Welcome back, everyone, to The Change Log, a podcast featuring the hackers, leaders, and innovators of software development. I'm Jared Santo, managing editor here at Change Log. Today, computer scientist Yao Anakwa joins the show to tell us how Open Data Kit is enabling data collection efforts around the world. From monitoring rainforests to observing elections to tracking outbreaks, ODK has done it all. We hear its origin story, ruminate on why it's been so successful, learn how the software works, and even answer the question, are people really using it in space? All that and more coming right at you. There's probably a thousand ways you can use a computer science degree, right? And being in school so long to get a PhD in computer science must be just a life's journey, right? But I'm sure you've got some extreme opinions on how to best use a computer science degree in these ages. Yeah, I have some, some thoughts on that. I, uh, I, yeah, I was in school for a very long time and sort of early in that PhD journey, as I like to say, I sort of had a, a moment where I realized that the stuff that I was working on didn't really, you know, it didn't really matter to people. It didn't seem to have uh, a meaningful impact. It was just like a fun thing to do. Sort of during that period, I, I got a chance to travel to some places in rural Africa where I saw how technology could really make a difference. And that really moved me to sort of stop working on stuff that didn't really matter to people and start focusing all the time and energy in school and education on stuff that I thought could really make a difference today to people who needed it. And so I think there's always going to be like lots of people who are working on ad targeting or some of the stuff that big tech companies work on, but I feel a real strong passion for, you know, using technology to help folks who need help. And so I've dedicated, I guess, most of my graduate career and postgraduate career to, to working on that problem. Give us an idea of your, your journey in school. Like just what's it, what's required to get a PhD in computer science? Um, stubbornness. <laughs> Tenacity. <laughs> resilience. Tenacity. Yeah. All those things. Uh, so I have sort of a, a strange entry into, into computing. I'm originally from Ghana in West Africa, and I moved to the States when I was about 10 because my dad got a job teaching at Butler University. And I remember coming to the States for the first time, walking into my dad's house and seeing a, a little Mac SE. You know, and uh, I remember my dad saying, like, don't touch that. And yeah, naturally, I spent pretty much every waking hour I had Playing with that computer, just more on a college campus, got a chance to just like go to the library. They had old Vax terminals there and play with those. Um, and so I was pretty in love with computing from, from a pretty young age. I ended up going to Butler University uh, and got a bachelor's in computer science and another in electrical engineering to do both simultaneously. There's a special program there that you could do both. And went on to do a master's in computer science from UW. University of Washington in Seattle. And during that process, it was sort of when I had this sort of come to Jesus moment about, um, you know, working on meaningful, meaningful problems. To sort of answer the core question, what does it take to get a computer science? I mean, I really think, you know, obviously you have to have some minimum threshold of, you know, interest in computing and be reasonable at math. 
And then the rest is, you know, being fortunate enough to have a good advisor who can guide you. And then, you know, stubbornness. I think it's really the key. So you might have an interesting opinion on this. A, a little while back, episode 339, we had Adam Barr on the changelog. He's a 23-year Microsoft vet. Wrote a book recently called Why Smart Engineers Write Bad Code. And uh, it was critical of academia with regards to computer science specifically. And his reasoning is because he says in his experience working with a lot of uh, schools that during a computer science, maybe this might be just a bachelor's degree, they do not have the necessary scope requirements, like the, the depth of the systems that are built just because of the time involvement, because of the curriculum and these other things aren't real world enough to actually get you what you need once you get out there. You've been, you've been in academia for a long time. Do you, does that resonate with you or do you find that maybe does, does not? Or what are your thoughts? Yeah. So um, I, I have been in academia for a long time and, and my wife is also a, a programmer and she taught at the University of Washington the intro classes as well. And so, yeah, I have some pretty strong opinions. You know, for me, the goal of a particularly a computer science degree isn't, to, it's not a trade school. You know, the goal isn't to teach you how to be a good programmer. The goal is to teach you about computing and how to use computing to sort of solve problems. Um, and so the focus shouldn't necessarily be on, you know, languages. It should be more on, in my opinion, you know, algorithms, uh, decomposing problems, having um, sort of the, the fundamentals that you need. Uh, to learn you know, different types of programming languages, getting exposure to that. And then the hope is that once you start, you know, once you start getting into the world at large, you have the sort of the basic skills needed to actually build systems and, and learn rapidly. So that to me is like at the bachelor's level, what you should be learning. At the master's and PhD level, you know, the goal isn't, it's just to come up with a new idea and uh, evaluate that idea on some particular dimension. You will find a lot of PhDs in computer science aren't necessarily good at programming, but they are very good at solving, you know, that class of problem where there's a new problem, a new way of thinking, and they've measured it in some way. They've done science on it. Yeah, I mean, I think boot camps are more like what, um, if you want a sort of a more trade approach where you get a bunch of skills, that's where you get, get that. But for me, computer science degree, bachelor's level really about a set of skills, you know, a way to think about computing. Yeah. So if somebody came up to you today in 2019 and said, I want to be a software engineer, would you advise them to start in a trade situation, start with a boot camp, and then backfill perhaps the, the fundamentals later with a bachelor's degree if they want? Or would you say, go to a four-year college? I'm just curious what your advice would be. Um, maybe I'm old-fashioned. Um, you know, I'm an academic, my wife's an academic, my parents are yeah. academics. So <laughs> I would say definitely a four-year uh, degree. For me, it's, it's not just the, the idea of just getting the skills needed to become a good software engineer. It's also about, you know, I went to a liberal arts uh, school for undergrad. It's also about getting, you know, exposure to different parts um, of the world, you know, language, music, religion, um, and all those influence the kind of work that you do. You know, in my particular case, my dad's a journalist. Uh, and so I spent most of my undergrad uh, building an online newspaper. And um, I learned a lot from that experience. And that informs the kind of programmer and software engineer that I am today. You know? So I think just a strict focus on you know, acquiring a particular set of skills, it lacks some of the richness that I think a four-year degree potentially gets you. Um, yeah. I, I think we need that versatility in our education system. Hmm. So you mentioned that many computer science PhDs aren't necessarily good programmers. Would you consider yourself a good programmer today? I would not consider myself a good programmer <laughs> today. Um, why not? Why not? Um, one is practice. I don't, these days, um, I don't spend a lot of time writing code. I'm sort of uh, doing a lot of everything from marketing, to fundraising, to community management, thinking about governance. And so day to day, what I mostly do is write emails and think, think about writing emails, write those emails, full up on, on those emails. Yeah, that's where I spend most of my time. And really, at the end of the day, it's like communicating with folks, making sure everybody's on the right page, and making sure that everyone in the community, 
at the company, we're all sort of moving in the right direction. It's probably bad for the project if I'm writing code. <laughs> I guess go. it means other high level stuff isn't getting done. Well, let's let's turn our focus to the project. We want to hear about how it, it started. It's called Open Data Kit or ODK for short. And I should mention up front here that I would not have heard of this uh, were it not for Brett Neese in our ping repo. So uh, thanks, Brett. And uh, I was just thought I'd read what he said was interesting about it. But we want to hear the history of this before you bring us up to like present day, what that community looks like and everything. And he says to him, what's interesting about ODK is that it's used in a lot of different environments. Uh, than some of the software that we talk about commonly on the change log. He says it's similar to Singularity in that way. You guys can go back and listen to that Singularity episode if you want another different thing. And he says it seems to target a more academic audience, which makes sense talking to you, Yao. It's used anything from monitoring rainforests in the Amazon to observing elections in Albania to tackling Ebola in West Africa. Brett personally uses it uh, in an engineering firm where he maintains an ODK server to collect data from telephone pole inspections. So pretty much data collection is what it's about, hence the name Open Data Kit. And really, it seems to be about bringing data collection capabilities to places where it previously wasn't or couldn't be for various reasons. So thanks, Brett, for, for bringing this to our attention, and we hope you enjoy this conversation. You were, you were right. This is very interesting, and Yao has a very interesting backstory on how this whole thing came to be. So. Yeah, tell us about that. Open Data Kit was part of your work at your uh, university, and it's still going today. So very valuable. How did it start? Yeah, um, I could talk a little bit about that. So um, I moved to Seattle in uh, 2005. I was accepted to a PhD program at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I I went there actually. I was going to study AI, um, and I sort of I abandoned that notion pretty quickly, um, mostly because I found I had a great relationship with a uh, professor there, Gaetano Borriello, who really sparked my interest in, at that time, it's called ubiquitous computing, this idea that you can have computing everywhere, and human-computer interaction, um, human interfaces to these computers. Um, and so I started working with Gaetano, um, and uh, uh, during probably my second year, I saw a talk at UW um, from a guy called Neil Lesh, who was at that time sort of a wandering guru. You know, he'd walk, he'd, he'd travel from place to place, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, and help hospitals or whomever needed help um, with whatever computing problems that they had. Um, and that really sort of inspired me. I was going through a time in my life where um, I felt like the stuff that I was doing didn't really have a broader impact. And it seemed like, you know, all this education for, you know, for not a lot of value to the, the population at large. Um, and so I got a chance, uh, after listening to Neil, I got a chance to uh, sort of put a, a, a pause on my, my master's degree at that time and go to Rwanda to work uh, with a group called Partners in Health. And at that time, they were deploying a medical record system, an open source medical record system called OpenMRS. And so it was, and it was, they were doing it in a small town uh, in rural Rwanda. And I saw during those, I think, six months that I was there, how important an electronic medical record system could be to treating HIV and TB patients. A lot of chronic care like HIV and TB is done on paper, and paper really sort of limits how effective you can be at treating those patients. It's not like malaria where you get treated once and you go away. Um, it's like every, you know, every few weeks, every few months, you're at the hospital. So um, electronics definitely helps. So, electronic medical records definitely helps. And so I saw that experience and I learned from it and I saw how important paper was to the process and how critical electronic medical record systems could be to sort of reduce medical disease. And so I kept sort of wandering Africa at the time and uh, Gaetano sort of summoned me back <laughs> uh, to Seattle and said, you know, you've been wandering for a while uh, and he was going to uh, take a sabbatical from UW to go to Google to work on a mobile data collection project. This was right before Android was released. And so Gaetano had this idea that a lot of his students were sort of working in this technology for development space and that the common themes seemed to be uh, removing sort of paper and, and digitizing processes. So um, I thought this idea was terrible, to be honest. Uh, I was like, 
I was like, I don't really, yeah, I was like, I'd rather just bum around Tanzania for a little bit. I don't really want to be back in Seattle and, and working on this stuff. Uh, but Gaetano and his students, a friend of mine, Carl Hartung and William Burnett, sort of convinced me that it was worthwhile. So the three of us went to Google as interns for a year and built out what became initially uh, Open Data Kit. And uh, we did it open source from day one because we are, you know, we're researchers and grad students and we thought it was really important to make it open source available to as many people who wanted to sort of do research on it. And at that time, you know, Android just came out. We sort of released the first version of ODK um, as soon as Android was publicly released. Um, and actually, funny story, we took, at that time, there were um, the Sidekick style devices. Those initial devices, we took 20 of them. I think uh, Carl and myself were the first people to bring Android devices to the entire continent of Africa because <laughs> we're not released yet. We stuck them in our bags and took them to Uganda to do a, a quick project. And that's what kicked off the project. So from that was in 2008. From there, you know, we just, the three of us had a year at Google um, as interns and then went back to the university and started to build out what became, what became sort of this entire ecosystem uh, of tools. So that was in 2008 and now I guess it's 2019. So um, it's gone on to sort of become the standard tool and set of tools that folks use when they're collecting data in a sort of a field environment. And it all sort of started from that, um, that project was started when we were interns. Over a decade ago now. Yeah, it's crazy, right? The timing seemed perfect with Android coming out and the, the timing with regards to cutting over from paper to smartphones and tablets because now all of a sudden smartphones were available. I mean, the iPhone predated Android, but it wasn't going to reach into the same places that Open Data Kit wants us to reach into. Yeah, and that's one of the sort of the great insights of Gaetano was that, you know, he saw that this was really a good chance to be on a platform that worked on a number of different devices. You know, you have to remember we're coming from G2ME and uh, Blackberries at that time. And so the smartphone was really a powerful platform where we can build just a whole new generation of applications. And because Android was designed to work on a bunch of different hardware from a bunch of different manufacturers, we thought it was going to be really important that the places that we want to serve, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, remote jungles, that a variety of devices was really important. And so that kind of was able to convince, at that time, Andy Rubin, uh, who was running the, the Android team, this was a worthwhile thing to try. And so he funded us for that initial go. Um, and you know, it seems to have worked out very nicely. So when we talk about impact, ODK has been used now by thousands of organizations, such as the Gates Foundation, USAID, World Health Organization, Jane Goodall Institutes, collected billions of data points. Can you give us a few highlights, maybe, you, things personally that you've felt good about it being used for out there in the world, helping people? Yeah, um, there are a number of these kinds of projects. So just literally... <laughs> Two hours ago, um, we've got a word from the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, these are the folks who are currently working with the World Health Organization in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there's currently an Ebola outbreak that's happening in the DRC. I think there's been about 2,000 people infected currently. So the, in the first 300 or so days of the outbreak, um, this is the second outbreak that's happened. And so there's been a vaccine that has been created that is going through a set of trials. And so I think about 135,000 people have been vaccinated as part of that effort. And the documentation about that vaccine, who's gotten the vaccine, when and where and how much, um, that's all collected using ODK. And so there's been about, I think, 1 million submissions just from this outbreak alone that have come through ODK. Um, because of the tools that we've, we've built. So that's an example. Throughout, uh, in another health example, one of my favorites is polio eradication. And so from WHO, World Health Organization's polio eradication efforts from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, um, all those vaccination campaigns, when they go out and they vaccinate, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of kids, the documentation about that vaccination is all done through OK. The Jane Goodall Institute, when they're tracking conservation efforts 
in Tanzania, they use ODK. The Carter Center, um, Jimmy Carter, <laughs> Jimmy Carter tried out ODK and he said it was remarkable. That's one of my favorite stories. All the recent elections in Egypt and all these places, all that documentation is done through ODK. The tribes in the Amazon who protect their forest by documenting illegal logging, that's done through ODK. Um, so everything from there was an election in Albania like last last year that was, the monitoring was done. So everything from you know healthcare, the climate monitoring. I know the Portland bus public transit people they do their surveys through ODK. They have this sort of wide the tools have this wide usage where you know any time that you have essentially a piece of paper and you want to collect data on that piece of paper, but you want it to work offline and you want it to have logic. And you want it to have GPS coordinates or pictures. Anytime you have this process where you ordinarily collect data on paper, you can use ODK. And so I think over the last 10 to 12 years, I mean, we've, we've seen there's a project on the space station that uses it. So I mean, we've seen it uh, pretty much everywhere. And it's really uh, humbling in a way. Did you know there was an engineering firm out there using it to collect data from telephone pole inspections? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did, but I'm not surprised. One of the real uh, challenges of this open source in this way and is that we don't really have a lot of visibility. By design, we don't have a lot of visibility into who uses it. We, don't, we want people to own their data. And, um, own their data. So um, the telephone pole example is not, it doesn't surprise me anymore. I got an email from a, a team that, a manufacturing firm, I think, in China that makes the chairs, uh, the seats for Teslas. They use ODK. So it just seems to be ubiquitous now, but it's nothing surprised me anymore. Just I was at a dinner party, said what I was doing, and somebody said, Oh yeah, I use that. So yeah, it's <laughs> pretty cool. One of the points for software is to be adopted, right? One of the bigger hurdles of open source is to be adopted, to be to be widely used. What do you think for ODK was that was it simply the need? Was it being open source? Was it phenomenal marketing? What do you think made it be used so widely? I mean, I don't know about phenomenal marketing. <laughs> I don't think our marketing is that phenomenal. Uh, it's mostly me tweeting sometimes. So I think the important thing that allowed us to take off is luck, basically luck and timing. Um, so it was at a stage where Android was just coming out. We had, you know, Folks who were start stopping use of PDAs and digitally based phones and were looking for alternatives. And technology infrastructure in the places that we work, particularly, you're getting more smartphone and, and cellular infrastructure in sub Saharan Africa that took off. And then, you know, we were, you know, the core team were very committed to supporting our users. And so I think for a long time, for the project before it really got big, if somebody sends an email out to the ODK mailing list, um, somebody, generally, often me, would you get a response in you know under an hour. And so being able to support people who are using this piece of software was a, was a big, big sort of growth driver. And then the other thing is, I don't think open source matters as much in this use case, but free matters a lot. And so, for example, if you are, let's say you are at, the Red Cross, and there is, you know, this happened, this was in Mozambique, there was a hurricane, a cyclone, and you need to uh, go out and uh, hand out supplies and document what supplies you're handing out uh, to people, you're not going to be able to get a credit card. <laughs> you know, you, the country office doesn't have a credit card because it's Mozambique. Uh, by the time you get through the approval process at Red Cross, at a Red Cross in D.C. or in Geneva, you know, the crisis has magnified to the point where it's no longer tenable. So the fact that you can download it and use it for zero dollars is huge. If it was one dollar, the adoption wouldn't necessarily be there. So I think the free is, a, is, a, is an important thing. The fact that it's open source also means that people don't feel locked in. So oftentimes we work, you know, we have projects with large governments and governments don't want to use, you know, a sales force or something where they are their data is trapped and services they don't control by companies that they have no jurisdiction over. And so for very large health projects, say in a, you know, in a Kenya or in Nigeria, the fact that it's open source makes a huge difference. 
So I think those are the things that played up, you know, you know, luck and timing. Um, but the fact that it's free and that folks who deploy it have ownership of their data and their infrastructure is really, I think it's a, it's a big part of it. This episode is brought to you by GoCD. With native integrations for Kubernetes and a Helm chart to quickly get started, GoCD is an easy choice for cloud native teams. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale build infrastructure on the fly for you. GoCD installs as a Kubernetes native application, which allows for ease of operations, easily upgrade and maintain GoCD using Helm, scale your build infrastructure elastically with a new elastic agent that uses Kubernetes conventions to dynamically scale GoCD agents. GoCD also has first-class integration with Docker registries, easily compose, track, and visualize deployments on Kubernetes. Learn more and get started at gocd.org slash Kubernetes. Again, gocd.org slash Kubernetes. So free software is nice. Well-timed software is nice. There's lots of, like you said, luck's always nice as well. There's lots of ways that you can get to that ubiquity, but you also can't get there if the software doesn't deliver on its promises. And so one thing I read is that you, you all had some early goals for ODK, and it seems like you achieved them at least to a certain degree, enough that people wanted to keep using the software. Um, and when those goals were, you wanted it to be easy, easy to try, easy to use, easy to modify and easy to scale. So the keyword there being easy. Curious how that came out and whether you felt you achieved it early on or today. Talk about these goals of yours. Yeah, I think it's pretty punchy, right? Nice, clever. Yeah. Clever uh, marketing there. Did um, you backfit that one? Mm. Or was <laughs> would you write it on day one? I think I, I think maybe day two or day three, I was in charge of... <laughs> Charge of marketing back then. Right? So, there you uh, go. Did you tweet that one? I there was no Twitter. I think <laughs> we started. <laughs> so I think it's in some some SVN was possibly somewhere. From my perspective, you know the and I think early founder perspective is that a lot of the folks that we were working with in the very early days didn't necessarily have technical expertise. So the sort of user that we we're dealing with is you know maybe a health organization who doesn't have a lot of funding. The people who are going out to collect the data are maybe a subsistence farmer who hasn't at that time seen a smartphone before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're given, I think at that time, the initial devices were $600. You're giving $600 devices to folks who don't have you know, any experience with smartphones. And some of the early problems that we were running into are, for example, I don't know if this is a podcast, but you should look at your hands. And if you feel your fingertips, they're like these soft, squishy fingers. And those work really, really well on smartphones because you don't have any calluses. If you do have calluses, if you work on a farm every day, your fingers don't really, they don't work on touch screens the same way. And so probably either have contacts or glasses. Most of our early users didn't have corrective vision. And so that's sort of the user base that we're working with. Uh, organizations that don't have a lot of technical capacity, users that aren't very technically experienced. And so easy was the only way that we could ensure that folks would use the tool. And so we spent a lot of time and we continue to spend a lot of time in the field working with folks, just watching how they use the software, making those adjustments. So easy to use means that, you know, the average country office or the average person who's doing the survey can design the surveys and get them onto the device. And an enumerator is what we call the people who collect the data. Uh, an enumerator can take the tool with a very little amount of training and can go out and collect data. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, easy to use, easy to try part. Uh, the scale is really critical because a lot of these projects, once they get going, they generate a ton of momentum. You know, I think at this point, if I look at sort of the mobile app over the last year, we've had uh, about two and a half million users use it 
um, and a lot of those users are in you know in Nigeria or in India, and so these projects um, collect you know when they start very small but they scale up really rapidly you know where they have thousands of people out in the field collecting you know tens of forms a day and so it just gets really big really quickly and so we want to make sure that the software while it's easy to try that once you ramp up and once you go to scale from your pilot it just kind of just keeps working and then modification is also really important because we can't predict everything and so we never wanted especially since we were just grad students working on another time a very small project we didn't want to be the blocker on some large project or some small project. And that if you wanted to take the software and it wasn't doing what you wanted, you could just take it and just modify it how you see fit to get your work done. And all these things have come, you know, it's been good and bad. You know, it's been good in the sense that our focus on ease of use um, with a little bit of flexibility has gotten the software to really um, get out there. And a lot of people use it. Um, but it also made makes maintenance, <laughs> maintaining and evolving it also um, a, a nightmare many times. There's an old SKCD comic where there's a guy who's fixed a bug and, you know, a, a user complains that, you know, this bug is like critical to my, my use case. I think the bug is something like, you know, my, my fans go up to 100% and, um, and so I fix this bug. Performance is back down to normal. The fans don't pick up anymore. And then somebody writes in and says like, oh, you know, this fan, the, I use like a temperature sensor on my computer to like, you know, run this command in Emacs, you know? And so you've broken my workflow, just add a, a, a preference. So a lot of ODKs like that, there's stuff that you may think are easy to modify and easy to scale and all these things, but the process of maintaining and evolving the software is sometimes lighter, but that's just software, I guess. Yeah, especially valuable software. The more valuable it is, the harder it is to change over time because yeah. more people are using it. You have more people using it in, in places where you didn't expect or rely, like you said, they rely on that bug. Hey, I, I needed that bug. Mm -hmm. I would imagine too that you have some issues potentially because you've got people that are using these devices that may be learning as they go. And it might even be, I'm assuming it might even be kind of hard to get the, the bug report, so to speak, from the... Uh, actual user yeah it's a really it's a very insightful comment because our sort of the person who touches the software you know we have this active uh, community forum with about nine thousand people on it which is great and um all of these folks none of most of these folks on the forum aren't numerators or people collecting the data and and so you know when we roll out a software update we know it's going to devices that are people are in situations that sometimes are life-threatening, um, there are situations where they can only be there once to collect data. Um, it's sort of a one-shot thing, but they're just using the software. They're not technical experts, and so it's rare that we get a bug report from a from a user. Our bug reports come through either great logging and betas, and also just being super super careful about incrementally rolling out things. So we get a chance to gather feedback from, from folks uh, wherever they are. So yeah, we don't often get bug reports from users. We get stack traces when there's a crash and try to have long beta. And we try to get people to try things out before it rolls out the population of ours. So we'll, yeah, it's a real tough problem. So let's dig into the software itself uh, for a little while here. I think, I'm sure it's changed over time. It sounds like now you have two sets of suites. ODK, which is for the common case, and then ODKX for complex workflows. Maybe we can talk about ODKX a little bit later. But ODK itself also seems to have at least two parts. Maybe there's more now, but it started off as the collect side, which I assume is the Android app, the data gathering piece. And then there's the aggregate side, which is some sort of ser it's a storage management thing, That's as well as I understand them right now. Uh, unpack that for us and then help us understand how I get the collection and I get the aggregation, but then also how are the surveys themselves defined and designed by your enumerators? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so uh, because the project has evolved over time, now there are sort of two suites. Um, there's you know, ODK, which is sort of the classic ODK that everybody knows, and then there's ODKX, which is um, they're not really competitors, but it's like a different take on the data collection problem. And so it, there's trade-offs as far as complexity and ease of use of power. So I'm going to focus on sort of the core ODK tools that I think most people know. Mm -hmm. 
and those are the ones that are just like really in, in widely deployed. So the reason it's called Open Data Kit, and the kit is really important, is because it's a series of tools that all sort of plug and play to let you collect and manage your data. And so there's ODK Collect, which is the mobile app, and that essentially renders forms that you collect it data. There's ODK Aggregate, which is a server, a Java-based server that runs either locally or on the cloud. We also have ODK Central, which is another server, but different stack. We have ODK Build, which is a form designer. And then we also have uh, ODK sort of XLS Form, which is another form designer. So probably the easiest way to explain this is to sort of walk you through the process of what it takes to sort of get an ODK, we call it campaign, up and running. So let's say you have a paper form with three questions, name, age, and gender, maybe a GPS location. The way you would get this form sort of designed is that you use a tool like ODK Build, which lets you sort of drag and drop questions into a web interface. And once that questionnaire is essentially designed, you hit publish and it goes to your ODK aggregate server. And so once that form is on the server, the server takes that form and uses it to build a database backend with all the tables that you need. Uh, you connect ODK Collect, your mobile client, to the aggregate server, and it pulls down the form, renders it on the device. You can go out, you can collect your data. When you're ready, you hit submit, and then that data goes back to aggregate. So you use build to design the form, aggregate to host the form and the submissions, and collect to collect the data. So that's a very typical use case. Because we have a kit, there's other ways of doing it. So if you don't like a drag and drop form designer, we have an Excel-based form designer that's extremely popular, probably the most popular way that people design forms called ODK XLS form. And so essentially each row in your spreadsheet is a, a question that somebody's going to ask or, or see. If you don't like aggregate, which is a Java robust, but pretty heavy Java based server, we have ODK Central, which is another server that's built um, primarily JavaScript based. And so people can pick and choose which tools work best for their scale or for their users. But fundamentally, you design a form, you put it on a server, and then the, the phone talks to the server to uh, send those submissions. One important thing to stress in all of this, and the real the value add of ODK, well, it's a bunch of value adds, but the big one is that it's all offline. So ODK, you know, people think of forms, they think of maybe SurveyMonkey or something like that, Wufu. ODK is designed to run entirely offline. The forms can be designed offline. You can collect your data offline. You can go out, we have folks in the rainforest, you can be out for months at a time, collect all your data. It can opportunistically send data to the server when it gets it, but it's all designed to be offline. It's also designed to work really well with the, the UI sort of designed to work well with lightly trained users. So folks who've never seen smartphones before, everything is big, high contrast. It's designed to work in multiple languages. So the mobile, yeah, the mobile client, for example, is translated by our community into 56 languages, last I checked. Um, so you can have the app itself that's translated into different languages. And then the forms themselves that are on the app can be in different languages. So you can have a phone that's configured, all the menus are in French. And then you can open up that a survey and toggle that survey between French, Japanese, Swahili. You can even have an emoji font. You don't need to have text to describe the forms. For example, you can have video or audio uh, instead of like question text. And this is really important for our users who may not, who may not be literate. So you can essentially have a survey where it's just a series of videos that are showing the person what kind of information you want to collect. So it ends up being, again, you know, it's like SurveyMonkey, but like crazy powerful and all working offline. So hopefully that should give you a sense. You build a form, you get it on the server, and then you collect the data, but you know, it's uh, more powerful than that. I'd be curious, is there any way of printing a form and then ingesting it via OCR or something later? Because that would be the ultimate in, in going into the far reaches is you don't need batteries, you don't need a, a device at all, but you could just like scan the answers later. Yeah, so there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great idea. So the way we actually handle the battery problem um, is interesting because, because we're on Android, we run on a bunch of different devices. So Mm -hmm. I think at this point, 14,000 different devices that we run on. And wow. some of those are, uh, there's TVs. We run on TVs. If you want to take a TV out into the field <laughs> to collect data, we can, we, we support that. But there's also a lot of low power devices like um, uh, e-readers that the data collection works on. 
You can mm. handle batteries that way. There's also the variety of devices also lets us handle different use cases. So I keep talking about Amazon Rainforest. But there's places with heavy canopy where you need an external GPS and a device that is, you know, um, extremely humidity proof. And so we run on those devices as well. As far as um, being able to do OCR, um, we do have some sort of researchy apps. I think one's called ODK Scan that does exactly that, where you can essentially annotate a sheet of paper, collect the data that way, feed it into the app. It's not as widely deployed as the rest of the other tools. That's really cool. I love that it runs on e-readers. That's neat. And I mean, TVs just seems like kind of ridiculous, but okay. <laughs> it's ridiculous, but you know, it turns out um, it's great for training. Um, okay. So if you are at some you know, ministry of health uh, and you don't have a device there, but you have an Android enabled uh, TV, you can just go to the Play Store, download the app, and you can walk through some complex forms and really show folks what the, you know, what the app looks like and how it works. So you never know. Yeah, you never know. What's deployment like from to all the different devices, how they get the forms? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of ways of doing that. So I would say a let's take a small deployment. So a small deployment, let's say there's 10 data collectors or numerators who are going out in the field. Maybe one person who's maybe more experienced, a supervisor has designed a form. So they design a form using maybe the Excel-based tool. It's been, they've set up a server in the cloud. So they put the form on the server. And then they take the 10 devices that they have, they configure just one, and then um, in ODK Collect, you can, once you've configured the device, it can generate a QR code. And then you take the other devices and you scan that QR code and it configures that, the rest of the devices that way. Um, so this essentially, you can either type stuff in manually on all 10 devices, which seems annoying, or you can just configure one and then scan the devices. And so uh, once those 10 devices have been configured, the phone can then download the forms that are available on the server onto the device and then you can go about your day collecting your data. So that's for a very small deployment. For large deployments, if you have 10,000 phones, then you need more people, but you can essentially also put a settings file onto the device however you want to do that. And the reason that this configuration is really important is because of the flexibility of the mobile client. So there's like buttons on the on the screen that you may want to hide. You may not want your numerator to be able to delete data once it's collected, for example. And so uh, each device has to be uh, configured for the appropriate permissions levels for you know, a, a particular deployment. What if you're going to deploy it into space? What if you're going to deploy it into space? Yeah, the space, <laughs> the space project is really interesting because it was, they had about 3,000, this is a project, something about five or six years old now, uh, they had about 3,000 people in rural Kenya um, handing out water filtration devices and collecting data, GPS coordinates and barcodes of each device that was collected. And then they were sending it off to a server. And the campaign was being was run by an astronaut. And so he was in space <laughs> configuring devices and playing with the, the, with the data on the server. So it turns out when you're deploying in space, there isn't dramatically... At least for our software, there isn't a dramatically different set of steps that you have to follow. So that's nice to know. Yeah. For my next space deployment, I just do the regular thing. Just do the regular thing. It'll, it'll work great. It sounds like, you know, an early need to do offline was, was a pretty significant thing for adoption because there isn't always a network. I'm wondering, is there like a local LAN kind of scenario where maybe there's a network, just not a WAN? Is, is that kind of how this works in a way where... You may be offline, but you're sort of on a local network, but still kind of not really online, but kind of offline. I mean, there are some projects where, you know, they'll have a hotspot or something. And so for those kind of deployments, you can imagine, you know, I'm in a small city, not of the main city, but I'm a small city. I've sent out a bunch of data collectors to even more rural locations. They come back to the hotel in the small city, they set up a WAN, and then they, you know, they submit data to a a desktop computer that's running the server software. That's one kind of use case. But the more common use case is that there's no connection whatsoever, no WAN, no nothing. And so um, you're out, you collect the data, and, but there's almost always a cell network nearby or close enough. And so it's at that point where if you have a connection, you can send to the server. So that's a second common use case. 
And then the third common use case is that there's no connection, no internet anywhere. And so you just plug the phone into um, the computer. And then we have desktop software that pulls the data from all the devices that you plug into it and then it generates whatever reports it. Good old wires making it happen. Yeah, good old wires. <laughs> <Sneaker net. laughs> I love talking about software that's been around and used for a long time because you guys have been through so much. Like you handle so many different cases. It's not like this is a beta or this is a 1.0. We didn't think of that. I mean, everything we've thrown at you. You're like, oh yeah, this is how it works. This is how you do it. Here's a weird scenario. It still works. It's just not great or whatever. But there's just, there's something about software that's stood the test of time and been used in mass for a long time where sure it's got its warts. It's got its bugs that are actually features that are actually bugs. But it also has like a lot of weird, strange things that it can manage because it's had to. Yeah. And one great example of this is we had some folks, uh, one guy show up on our forum and say what he was using ODK for. And as a gift to his wife, he had built essentially a jukebox with a software. So I have to explain this because it's a little crazy. So if you think of something like SurveyMonkey, you know, you can have questions that are radio button questions, right? You know. And then you can have the next screen show results based on those actions. And so in ODK, you can have text answers, but you can also have audio answers, uh, options when you're doing this radio button. And so he had built a hymnal where the radio button selected the song you wanted to play. When you go to the next screen, it would show you the lyrics of the song plus an audio snippet that you could play it. And so... You know, when people think of data collection, they really think just purely as a, you know, a replacement for paper forms. But what it ends up being is a, a sort of a lightweight programming environment for folks who are super creative. And so those use cases, there's use cases where people build a form that's really a triage protocol. And so you can hand this phone to a nurse and they walk through the same steps that a doctor would walk through to sort of triage a patient. So there's all these kinds of use cases that if you're at it for 10 years, um, you sort of cover the long tail of what people want to do. That's awesome. Yeah. On our last show, we were talking about CSS and HTML, and uh, there was a survey that went out about, and with survey questions about HTML and CSS. And one of the questions is, is was it HTML, Adam? Is HTML a programming language? Or is, is, is CSS a programming language? And it was funny because we had a, a brief conversation about it, but then on the interwebs throughout this week, there's been the conversation of like, are these things programming languages? And let me just go back. Last week I was saying it's not a programming language. Okay, CSS can do some crazy stuff I didn't realize. So uh, yes, it's Turing complete. Um, so I take it back. I was wrong, Adam, you were right. Um, it just shouldn't be. It shouldn't be one, but it is. And so that made me think of, okay, they're using ODK for all these crazy things. It leads to the question, is ODK a programming language? It might be. It's so, it, I would say it's not, you know, the tools, maybe this gets into sort of the underpinning technologies that we use. So the forms that you're using the drag and drop form designer or you're using the Excel-based form designer, all of those sort of output uh, an XML document. And that XML document is an X form. And so X form is this old standard that IBM came up with, open source standard, for forms. And I think ODK and maybe Orbion Forms, which is another open source uh, project, are probably the only people on the planet who continue to use X Forms. But we found it a really powerful standard for Turing complete forms. And our engine is a little, it's not as powerful as it could be, uh, but essentially lets you do all sorts of crazy things with these X Forms. And so for our users who are particularly advanced, who step outside of the graphical designer or outside of the Excel-based designer and, and jump into raw XML, you can build some really powerful tools using that form spec. So yeah, it is, I don't know if we can guarantee that it's during complete, you can build some wild stuff. <laughs> you can build some wild stuff with these forms. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Rollbar. Move fast and fix things like we do here at Changelog. Check them out at rollbar.com slash changelog. Resolve your errors and minutes into public confidence. Catch your errors in your software before your users do. And if you're not using Rollbar yet or you haven't tried it yet, they want to give you $100 to donate to open source via Open Collective. And all you got to do is go to rollbar.com slash changelog, sign up, 
integrate Rollbar into your app. And once you do that, they'll give you $100 to donate to open source. Once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. So yeah, earlier you said that you don't feel like you're a good programmer anymore. And then you went on to list off what sounds like some pretty amazing software that's come from ODK in that project. So I'm guessing you have more people than just yourself involved because you got a lot of awesome software out there and uh, surely didn't build it all by yourself. Can you tell us about the team, the, the community, what it, what's grown, who's involved, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So, the yeah, you're right. I didn't build a <laughs> Actually, I did. It was a long decade of writing code. <laughs> you know, ODK is possible only because, you know, there is a community of people behind it. And when I say community, I don't just mean the software developers. I mean, you know, everybody who files a bug report is a community member. Everybody who writes a little piece of doc as a community member, whoever does a, a training, because it's only through like the individual efforts of uh, these folks that the, the stuff works. And this is really important in our use case, because I think we had talked about earlier that most of our users are not technically savvy. And so for some people, you know, we we're out in the field and we see that somebody's struggling with like a bug, a very subtle bug. And this has been a bug that's been there for a while. And maybe millions of people have experienced this bug, but nobody complained. You know, nobody said to their supervisor or hopped on our forum to complain. And so everyone who does that or who, who contributes to the project really is, is a member of the team. The project is organized currently as, you know, there's a project management committee that sits at the top. Each of the suites of software have their own technical steering committee. And so I'm going to focus on sort of the ODK technical steering committee. We have folks from companies within the ecosystem who are there as sort of oversight of the project. And then the core software development, the majority of it is done by Nafundi, which is a, a company that I, I, I run. So we have a team now of about seven to 10, depending on how you count, who do the core development on the tools. And then um, we have a number of contributors that have come in through either Summer of Code, are just you know people who use the software, are fans of the software, who sort of contribute you know code, and so the way it t typically works is that we start from our forum, where almost uh, all the developers and a big part of sort of the more experienced users live. When they have feature ideas or feature suggestions, we have those discussions on the forum. Once it's to a point where we feel like ah, that's a pretty good feature idea, it's inspect out. It goes to the technical steering committee where we sort of discuss it, make sure it's within our scope and what we want to build. And then that goes to GitHub where it's filed as an issue. And then um, someone, usually somebody from the team at Nafundi, built it. It's PR the re is reviewed by somebody else and then eventually gets merged and it's released. We usually have monthly or every two months. It's eventually released to the community. There's a beta, but then it's released to the community. So that's how it works. Um, I, I would guess most of our contributors uh, contributions come in. Uh, not we have a few contributors who are regulars on the code side, but we have a ton of contributors on the support side. People who show up to our forum, who are use ODK, who like it, and who are there to sort of answer support questions from other newer folks in the community. We have a lot of those kind of contributors. That's how it happens. That's how the magic happens. I just want to say those kind of contributors are awesome. They just hang out. They're there. They're part of the community. They answer questions. I just feel like they're, sometimes they're the unsung heroes of communities because they don't, they don't normally get the press or the thanks or much, but that hugely valuable and really make a, they make a, a group feel like a community or, you know, people feel like a family or whatever, because they're there and they're part of the team, even though they're just happy users, you know? Yeah, and I think in, in our case, it's so important. Well, one is I'm biased because I spent you know, the vast majority of my time on the project is spent you know, answering support questions. I find it really valuable because one complaint means that there's probably like 10 people who have that particular problem. And so the more support questions you answer, the more in tune with what the needs of the 
of the broader user base are. And so, you know, at Nafundi, we try to make sure that every dev is on the forum and is answering support questions. Uh, because if you're not doing that, you're not feeling the pain and you're just, you're just building random stuff then at that point, you know. So. It emotionally connects you to the software you're making because you can truly see the people that are using it, the impact, the errors or bugs or, you know, downsides of software, how they're impacting that person. And, you know, it, it provides an empathy path. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So when did you start Nafundi and what gave the idea to do this and how is it going? So Nafundi started, let's see, ODK started in 2008 and Nafundi started in 2011. It was founded by myself and Carl Hartung. Carl was also my uh, a co-founder on ODK and no longer with the company, but you know, we are still here and growing like crazy. So the company started because Carl and I wanted to keep working on ODK. So, you know, eventually you graduate, uh, eventually they give you a PhD and over, you know, since 2008 to 2011, you know, we had poured a lot of time and effort into not just the software, but growing a community and ecosystem around it. You know, I can't speak to Carl, but, you know, and for me, I felt like a deep responsibility to try to keep it going as long as I could. Carl agreed. And so we also kept getting uh, projects, people kept using ODK at scale and needed help. And so in 2011, when we graduated, or when we decided we were going to graduate in 2012, so in 2011, we started the company as essentially provide professional services on top of ODK. And so within the first few months, larger and larger projects were coming our way. And so our model uh, at that time was, you know, we take consulting dollars, we charge a premium, and then, you know, we do forks or we do core contributions and whatever margin that we get, we use it to work on the unpleasant infrastructure or core changes that no one was paying for. So, you know, just standard professional services, open source sorts of stuff. Um, over the last two years, we've moved more into doing grant writing. And so at this time, myself and Alain Martin um, are now owners of the company. And, you know, our model is, you know, we do maybe like 25% consulting work. Um, but 75% is grant funded. So we go to folks like you know, large foundations, government entities like USAID, Gates Foundation, and we make the case that ODK is a critical part of the global health and global development infrastructure, and that a lot of their grantees and their projects use the software, but don't necessarily have a line item to support it. So like, I think it's really awesome that you know, World Health Organization or the Carter Center or, you know, a Red Cross uses a software. But when a person with, when an organization with 10,000 users shows up on your forum, that's not a gift necessarily. You know, it's a responsibility. And, um, and the reality of our project and is that we need resources to be able to fund developers who are essentially full-time who can make sure that we, we take a long-term view support the, the tool. And so we make that case to to grants and to funders. Um, and they've historically been agreed with that, <laughs> that logic and that rationale. And so they essentially we essentially get grants to pay for the core developers who are there every day doing unpleasant stuff, you know, like you know, daytime migrations. You know? Like nobody no contributor want, wants to make sure that the app you know respects time zone um, or is tested on, you know, every device known to man. So you raise grant funding that way to pay for the core team. And then uh, the core team's mission really is, to, you know, to do the messy stuff, but also put processes in place that enable others to contribute. You know, as you know, a lot of open source projects, most of your contributors are going to be drive-by. And so making sure that we're not just like fixing stuff, but we're putting together a process that allows external contributors from wherever they are to contribute to the project. That's a big part of what we do as part of the, the folks that we bring on to work, you know, full time. What I, what I find interesting here is how you've changed how people pay for software like this, right? Like it's still, it's free, but it's not free to build. Like it takes people power. It takes planning, et cetera, support, as you've mentioned. And rather than having the, you know, would be enumerators or form designers or people who, are at the forefront of the problems, having to swipe a credit card or find a way to pay for software that they haven't been able to sell yet to their organization. 
you've been able to establish a better relationship down the line with the relate with the actual organization and potentially get grants to do, you know, large amounts of support and or development. That's, that's super cool how you plan that out. Yeah. Plan that out is a very kind thing. Of- Stumbled into maybe it, it sort of emerged. You know, I wish there were. You know, I spent a lot of time thinking about open source sustainability and these sorts of things, and I wish there were a better way of doing it. But the reality of our, you know, quote, customer base is, you know, most projects in global development, and global health, and sort of this bigger space are funded at a project level. So you will be able to get an organization to say do a malaria project or do a, a, an election, but there's no. There's nobody who's funding, like, you know, improved time zone support. And so you sort of have to, and I think it works best this way that you treat ODK as a public good, um, as infrastructure and convince the folks who, the sort of the biggest organizations who rely on that infrastructure to help support it. One question that I always get is that, is any of this stuff sustainable? I always find it really like an odd question because like, is Subway sustainable? Like, on what time frame are we talking about here? Right. At what point will it become not useful? Yeah. So I think for me, there's a couple of ways I respond to that. One is that you know, nothing is forever. As long as the software is in use, you take a step back. I thought when we started the project 10 years ago that it was a terrible idea and it was never going to work. Obviously, I was wrong. <laughs> I've stuck it through. And I always also thought that someone would come up with a better open source thing that would out innovate us or out you know compete us in some way. And that has not been the case. Um, I think the difference between ODK and some other projects is that people care about the project and so people show up every day, certainly I do, to chip away at the problem and try to make software that's a little bit better each day. I think if you do that over a decade, you know, it shows <laughs> things get better. So for me it's sustainable as long as people show up and use it. And it's sustainable as long as it's solving meaningful problems for folks. And I think that's a very easy argument to sort of make to somebody who wants to support the project. And so it's sustainable in that way. And if that way ends up not working, we'll try another way. So that's one approach to it. The other approach is a lot of the things that we do in the do-gooder space is not sustainable. It's not sustainable to deliver bed nets to people who, who need protection from malaria. We do it anyway. Um, because it's the right thing to do, and there's plenty of resources in the world to do it. For me, you know, the value that ODK generates in the world, as far as life saved and data decision making from elections to climate monitoring, you know, it's, it's in the tens of millions, maybe billions of dollars. Um, there's companies built on ODK. There are like software companies built on ODK. There are consulting organizations in a lot of countries that customize ODK for folks. And so there's a huge ecosystem there. And so the funding that we typically ask for is dramatically smaller than the value that we provide. And so to me, it's sustainable in that way. So the grant writing, you said you've been doing that for about two years. Have you found that to be a winning strategy thus far, something that you want to pour more into, or is it difficult to succeed in that way? You know, I think the grant writing is, you know, it's not fun. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) I love the chuckle afterwards. Yes. You know, it's not fun, um, but things that are important to do are often not fun. And so I'm committed to doing that as long as I I can. And so far, it's been working. And it's been working since 2011. And in 2011, we did not have as much impact as we have now. And so I'm optimistic that it will continue to work. But it's not the only thing that we do. You know, I'm always thinking of other ways to uh, get and, you know, more sustainable, consistent funding project. And so, you know, day to day, that's what I'm always thinking about. Because, yeah, grants aren't forever. But we have a, a pretty good consulting business as well. And so as long as that keeps going, we'll be able to manage. Have you tried hosting? Or is that something that you don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole? <laughs> I love hosting. Uh, we have a big, I just love DevOps, just as like a hobby. So um, I just love, I love hosting servers. Um, so I love DevOps. I think the challenge with hosting for ODK in particular is that, you know, there are other folks in the ecosystem who have a pure hosting business. And so I, as one of the project leaders, I want to be sensitive to not competing with our community members. You know, there's no point in bankrupting one partner just to fund the project. 
And so hosting is something that we've talked about at, at a project governance level, but I don't think currently, I don't think it's, it's necessary. I think it's also not, I think the reality is, so the largest streams of money, at least in, in our industry, um, a lot of it comes from, for lack of a better word, consulting. So services revenue feels to me like a, a better way of, of funding the project. But you, know, you never know. Things change, so we'll adjust as necessary. On the grant side, you mentioned that writing grants is not fun. And it's maybe hard to believe, but there are people out there in the world who enjoy writing grants. And so I would suggest that you try to find one of them and then you hire them to write the grants for you. And then everything's good, man. It'd be all good. <laughs> Get you back on those higher level things. That's right. It's the easy button. Yeah. There are people that like writing grants. I mean, maybe they don't love it. Maybe they don't wake up in the morning and just die into, but they like it. <laughs> well, maybe I'm not being fair to grant writing. It's not the most fun thing to do, but I also don't mind it. Okay. So it's quite all right. You know, I think, yeah, if there, maybe this is a good segue. If there are folks who want to contribute to a project and chip in on everything from grant writing to, you know, all the, the various things that we have on the project, you know, everybody is, is very welcome. And, you know, I try to maintain a very open definition of what a contributor is. Uh, we need all sorts of help. So don't let me just have all the fun. Yeah. Well, the next question was thinking about uh, Nafundi being a funding source for this, you know, a sustainable source for this, meaning that you might be hiring more people to contribute, not just to the project itself, but uh, to the the greater goal of Nafundi to do the same goals for ODK. Yeah, it's, um, I, I don't know if there are many companies who are, I mean, I guess there are some companies that are sort of really closely aligned to a project. For me, the folks who run Nafundi, our goal is to sort of align ourselves as closely to the benefit of the project. So um, we try to position the Fundi as a vehicle to grow ODK as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's way more important that ODK as a project survive and thrive than it is for the Fundi to survive. And so, yeah, it's really just a vehicle for us to do that. I look at that scenario like, Anybody who relies on a piece of equipment, right? Like in this case, ODK is Nafundi's piece of equipment, crucial piece of equipment to do the job, which is to create awesome surveys, forms, data collection processes, etc. You know, like if you swing a hammer and that hammer is your core piece of equipment, how do you treat the hammer? You probably shine it. You probably clean it. You probably maybe even put some special oil on the wooden handle. I don't know. I'm just thinking like you're going to take care of it basically. Like it's in your best interest. I don't know if you're going to shine a hammer necessarily. I'm just saying like you might go overboard at the point <laughs> in, in ensuring that this piece of equipment never fails you, that it's, it remains the hammer it needs to be. To the job. Show it with like a samurai sword, then you could sharpen it, you could <laughs> shine it. Yeah, maybe this, this metaphor doesn't work. But I mean, I, I think you're, 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 you're preaching to the choir here because right. I mean, certainly I, I agree with you. But when push comes to shove, I, you know, I find that a lot of people, I mean, if you just look at like OpenSSL, for example, there are a lot of companies that rely on this piece of software, but they don't necessarily treat it well. You know, and it's a structural and governance issue there. One thing that we're doing at ODK is taking a real close look at, about how we encourage other organizations to participate. You know, I was saying that we have this technical steering committee uh, with folks from different organizations. Um, we just launched a new sort of providers page where people who, organizations and individuals who contribute big chunks of time and effort to the project get listed as a recommended provider. You know, try to align the incentives. So the more support questions you answer properly, um, the higher up on the ODK website you go as a recommended person higher. And the questions have to be answered in the open. So for our individual contributors, that's like people who are helping get a chance to get hired. And then for the companies, you know, if we see that, you know, a lot of your devs are working on the core tools, then yeah, you are absolutely on the provider website. If somebody wants a customization or a large deployment that they should hire one of these, and then try to align it. So we don't have to depend on sort of the kindness of companies to do the right thing. It's just like, it helps your bottom line to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So where does the open data kit community live and what's the best way to get involved? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we live uh, currently at forum, F-O-R-U-M dot opendatakit.org. I always have to spell it out because form as in the survey form and forum are, yeah, it gets super confusing. Um, maybe we should just make that an alias. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's where the community lives. And so anyone who is interested in, in participating in the project can go to that forum. It's a discourse forum. Create an account and just introduce yourself. There's an introduce discussion thread. And just say roughly, you know, what you're interested in. So that's one way of doing it. And then sort of my commitment, to, whenever I see this, like my commitment to anyone who shows up and introduces themselves and says, you know, I'm interested in helping, is that I will take some time and we will talk about what you're interested in, what your skill set is, what you, how you want to grow, what do you want to do, and we will find a place in the project for you. So that's sort of a very hands-on approach, but it's an approach that we want to take because we want to make sure that it's not just... You know, that's a two-way street that we're, you're helping us and we're helping you in, in some way. So go to the forum and introduce yourself. If you're a dev and you just want to hack on code, certainly you can go to our GitHub page, you know, uh, github.com slash open data kit, all one word. And there's a bunch of repos there. Some of the started ones um, are the active ones. And then each repo has, you know, good first issues or quick wins. And so you can pick any issue, we have a contribution guide, and we follow that contribution guide to get the first PR, and then it will be reviewed, tested, and, and merged. And so that's another way of going. But the lowest bar, I think, is just go to the forum, say hi, and um, sort of join us. I should say that everyone is welcome, um, regardless of your skill set. If you're a designer, you're welcome. If you're a developer, you're welcome. If you love grant writing, you're welcome. If you want to help us on social media, you're welcome. Literally anything that you're interested in we will do our best to find a spot for you the forum now has i think almost ten thousand people nine thousand ten thousand people on it all helping each other and it's you know i participate in a lot of open source i'm a little biased but i think it's the nicest and friendliest community um out there so yeah we'd love to have anybody who wants to well yeah it's been an awesome conversation with you especially digging back into your journey kind of learning where you came from in terms of all this schooling to get a CS degree and to use it so wisely, so impactfully. I'm just, uh, I'm taking it back. You did an awesome job with all this and you're running a great community and we thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a sort of a great conversation. And, you know, I think I said very early on, I'm a long time listener of the Change Log, so it's really an honor for me to be here and share the work that the good folks in our community are, are doing. Well, let me say on our behalf, we were definitely glad to have you. Thank you so much. It was, it was awesome. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you for tuning into this episode of The Changelog. Hey, guess what? We have discussions on every single episode now. So head to changelog.com to discuss this episode. And if you want to help us grow this show, reach more listeners, and influence more developers, do us a favor and give us a rating or review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. If you use Overcast, give us a star. If you tweet, tweet a link. If you make lists of your favorite podcasts, include us in it. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner, Rollbar, our monitoring service, and Linode, our cloud server of choice. This episode is hosted by myself, Adam Stokowiak, and Jared Santo, and our music is done by Breakmaster Cylinder. If you want to hear more episodes like this, subscribe to our master feed at changelog.com slash master, or go into your podcast app and search for Changelog Master. You'll find it. Thank you for tuning in this week. We'll see you again soon.